amigos todos. IDEA tiene hoy el honor de recibir al profesor Marvin Miski del Instituto Tecnológico de Massachusetts y uno de los estudiosos y protagonistas más importantes en el amplio campo de las computadoras, las comunicaciones, la robótica y la inteligencia artificial. Todas estas técnicas están adquiriendo un papel cada vez más relevante en el mundo actual y pueden llevar a la humanidad a otros niveles y estilos de vida. A menudo, muchas de las personas que se consideran ajenas al área de la tecnología tratan estos temas como incomprensibles y lejanos y consideran a la inteligencia artificial como algo imposible o fantástico. Al rechazarla de plano, excluyen su participación en la discusión de cómo debe emplearse en el futuro, una decisión que por la importancia que tendrá en la vida de las personas requiere de la participación de todos. Marvin Miski sostiene que las ideas que desde la década del 50 están surgiendo alrededor de las computadoras marcan hitos nuevos en la historia y señala los cambios producidos en la descripción o representación del conocimiento. Cree que es esencial que todos los círculos culturales comprendan que la ciencia de la computación, infortunadamente no sabemos cómo llamarla con un término más adecuado, no es solo una técnica nueva para hacer cosas pequeñas, sino que lleva implícita una nueva comprensión de nosotros mismos y del mundo. El desarrollo y la evolución de la inteligencia artificial con el propósito de crear máquinas destinadas a, a desempeñar funciones que hasta ahora eran específicas de la mente humana, no es un proceso rápido. Han de pasar muchos años antes de la aparición de máquinas inteligentes. Serán décadas o siglos, según nuestra apreciación de qué es inteligencia, concepto este que variará sin duda con el tiempo. Esas máquinas aprenderán de sus experiencias podrán darse cuenta de situaciones diferentes, sabrán al elegir alternativas adecuadas y poseerán lo que denominamos habitualmente sentido común. Algunos piensan que los principios necesarios para construir máquinas inteligentes ya se conocen y que solo es menester construir computadoras más inmensas y más veloces. Miski, en cambio, cree que la creación de máquinas verdaderamente inteligentes requiere un conocimiento más profundo y nuevo de lo que es la mente. Con ese propósito publicó en 1987 un libro notable, La Sociedad de la Mente. En él, conjetura que la mente se compone de agentes que interactúan, ya sea activando o bloqueándose entre sí, 
en un equilibrio societario y esboza respuestas a preguntas como estas. ¿Cómo puede la materia del cerebro contener algo tan delicado y sutil como un pensamiento? ¿Cómo percibimos los objetos externos, sus relaciones y lo que ellos significan? ¿Cómo esa percepción nos conduce a la acción? La mente, según Miski, es una sociedad constituida por la interacción de infinidad de agentes simples, los cuales, a semejanza de lo que ocurre con la vida, organizada sobre la base de compuestos inanimados, carecen a su vez de toda actividad mental. En su teoría, Miski examina una cantidad de conceptos cercanos a los discutidos en los estudios de administración de empresas. En la actualidad, cuando muchas de las ideas de management están en reconsideración y reformulación, la presencia en idea del profesor Marvin Miski es altamente oportuna. Creo ver en algunas de sus apreciaciones sobre el funcionamiento de la mente similitudes con diversas orientaciones en auge, como ser la eliminación de jerarquías intermedias, el aumento del trabajo colaborativo entre todos los integrantes de una empresa, la introducción de modernas herramientas cooperativas, etc. En estos últimos tiempos, en que hemos visto sucumbir sistemas centralizados económicos y políticos, y cómo diversos gobiernos basados en rígidas planificaciones centralizadas no pudieron dar lugar a economías inteligentes, es interesante señalar una coincidencia con lo que la teoría centralizadora de la sociedad de la mente establece para las estructuras cognitivas. Miski cree que una mente regida por un sistema de planificación central en el sentido tradicional no puede conducir a un comportamiento inteligente adecuado. He sabido, además, que en el campo del management existe actualmente una cierta desilusión con respecto a enfoques enteramente formales o lógicos de la conducción empresaria. Miski, por su lado, cree que en el funcionamiento natural de la mente la lógica pura juega un papel, pero no debe considerársela como la esencia del pensamiento. El interés de Marvin Miski por los temas de la mente viene de antigua data. En 1946 ingresó en la Universidad de Harvard, donde estudió matemáticas, física, psicología, biología. Se doctoró en la Universidad de Princeton en 1954, con una tesis sobre el aprendizaje del sistema nervioso. Creó y dirigió junto a Seymour Papper, entre 1964 y 1973, el famoso Laboratorio de Inteligencia Artificial del MIT. Al genio de Marvin Miski se deben muchos desarrollos comunes en las computadoras actuales. Ya en 1964, cuando lo conocí, hablaba de la conveniencia de la introducción de procesos de paralelismo en las máquinas, concretada por sus alumnos en la Connection Machine, en 1985. Sostenía ya hace mucho tiempo que las investigaciones en inteligencia artificial y las relativas al pensamiento humano podrían eventualmente diverger, en especial, en áreas en las cuales las habilidades que pudiesen ser transferidas a las máquinas fuesen superiores a las similares humanas. Y también expresaba que el campo de aplicación de los psicólogos no quedaría limitado a los problemas humanos, una vez que se hubieran madurado suficientemente las aplicaciones de la inteligencia artificial a la creación de máquinas inteligentes. Decía en ese sentido que el entrenamiento de esas máquinas y su correspondiente control no se iban a realizar de manera sencilla y sin tropiezos y que los psicólogos de épocas futuras podrían llegar a envidiar los problemas elementales que debían enfrentar los psicólogos de épocas pasadas cuando solo tenían que tratar a seres humanos. Últimamente ha escrito en conjunto con el conocido autor de ciencia ficción Harris, Harrison, una novela en la que Carla las narra las vicisitudes del primer robot freudiano. Desde su creación, en 1985, pertenece al laboratorio de medios del MIT, 
donde desarrolla sus actividades y brinda continuamente especial consejo y asesoramiento a su director, Nicolás Necroponte. En 1989, el gobierno japonés le confirió el premio Japón en Ciencia y Tecnología, equivalente en el orden internacional al premio Nobel en otras disciplinas. Marvin Miski, creador de una nueva concepción de la mente humana y de los autómatas, estuvo ya en Buenos Aires en dos ocasiones, en 1987 y 1988. Es miembro correspondiente de nuestra Academia Nacional de Ciencias Exactas, Físicas y Naturales. Su nombre y sus trabajos son continuamente citados en todo tipo de publicaciones en el mundo entero. Sus ideas son expuestas en el curso Máster de IDEA, Introducción a los Sistemas de Información, a mi cargo desde 1991. En particular, creo oportuno para ofrecer un principio que enuncia en su libro y que yo traslado al ámbito empresario en estos términos. Algunos de los avances más cruciales en la evolución de una empresa se basan no solo en la adquisición de nuevas habilidades, recursos humanos o métodos, sino en la adquisición de nuevas formas administrativas de utilizar lo que está, ya sabe o tiene. El tema de su conferencia, Management Inside the Mind, la administración de la mente, está dirigida a todos, a empresarios, a funcionarios, a círculos académicos, y ha de versar sobre la administración de la mente, algo así como sobre la mente como una empresa. ¿Existe una estrategia de administración que conduce a la generación de pensamientos y a la toma de decisiones? Marvin Miski supone que la inteligencia de cualquier cerebro o máquina que posea mente surge como resultante del management peculiar de la compleja trama de agentes diminutos no inteligentes. Es esa maravillosa administración la responsable del milagro del fenómeno de la mente. Dear friend and professor Marvin Miski, well, welcome you here, and we thank you very a lot for being here. Oh, well. Uh, thank you very much. It's very glad to be. Boo. Glad to be in Buenos Aires again. I'm sorry, I can speak only English. But I have many pictures. But I'm afraid it will be hard to see the pictures for a few people. <laughs> so. Dangerous to. Oh, no. It won't. A little bit bigger. Always the connector is larger than the. Computer. <laughs> well, I'm going to talk about the intelligent machines of the future. So first I should say a little bit about the machines today and what they do and then what they do not do. Machines today are not very smart. And I want to discuss the contrast and what we can do to make machines more intelligent. Well, here's a good example of 
the good things about computers. Uh, I think most of you did some mathematics in your past. So this is a strange, wonderful example of calculus. Uh, I think everyone in this room has forgotten uh, how to do these problems, unless you're still a student. But uh, this is a problem in mathematics. And it started about 350 years ago, because the problem of, I don't have to explain what the problem is. It's not important. Uh, but the problem is that if you have this symbol, you have to get rid of that thing and get something else. So I can't explain it, of course. It's not important. But the problem started around 1630 with uh, Newton, or Leibniz. And they had to solve certain problems, and this was <laughs> I can't believe you can see. Uh, and this problem people worked on for many years, and it was finally solved in 1970. So that's 340 years or so. And it was solved by people in my group at MIT, plus Moses was the name of the principal student, and also a mathematician named Bobby Cavanis. And uh, Robert Risch. Anyway, uh, it's important to know that problems are solved by people. Uh, so, well, uh, one of the students in the very early days of of research on computers in 1961, still early, uh, wrote a program to solve this problem. But he solved it the way a uh, student solves it. Uh, it takes the problem and it changes it, then it, it changes it into some other problems and it experiments. You see, people tell you the computer does only what you tell it. Many people like the idea the computer is a good servant. But what Slagle did is he said, first try things, try this, then try this, try this. And so the computer made its own problems. Uh, and then it looked at the problem with a way to recognize patterns, and it said, that's bad. So I say the computer had a certain emotion. It, uh, he writes a program, Slagle wrote a program, that counts the symbols, you see. It says, this does not look bad. It's only a few letters. This is terrible because it has parentheses and powers. And uh, so it succeeds. And the point is that the program got a grade of A in the course. So you see, it's very funny that one of the first programs uh, gets a good score in a college level problem. So you could call this an expert. And in fact, over the years from 1961 to 1970, it got better and better. And by 1975, it was perfect. It could solve every problem of this kind that a person can solve. And so uh, now it's, now it has become uh, a commercial product called Maxima, and people who need to do integrals can buy it. Uh, that was commercial about 1980. What's the important thing? The important thing is that at the beginning, the machine does not know what to do, so it does experiments. And it tries this experiment, and that fails. It tries these two experiments. 
uh, this one leads to this, and this is that. So then the computer says, this one looks better, and it f quits. And then soon it... Uh... Well, you see, it's not important to know the problem. It's important to understand the management of the computer. It makes a number of plans, and then it evaluates the plans. And here's a, another, one more example, except I lost it. <coughs> this is 1988, so it's an old slide. And in 1988, a program to play chess in uh, Pittsburgh, where there's a great AI laboratory, uh, achieved the rank of international master. International master means that there are only uh, a few hundred players that are better uh, of humans. Uh, it's now uh, 1992, and I think the program got better, so now it's International Grandmaster, and I think there's only uh, less than a hundred of them. So this machine is very good. Uh, by the way, uh, it is not world champion, because the world champion, Gary Kasparov, has uh, beaten it twice. I have great respect for Gary Pas Kasparov because uh, he has no reason to play it. But he wanted to know. And he studied it very carefully. And he studied how it works and read all its games. And he said, this program is stupid. I can beat it easily. Uh, but if he had lost, he would uh, uh, be it was very interesting. So he's a very brave man. Um, and we don't know. Uh, is Gary P Kasparov much better than Deep Thought, or is he just a little bit better? Who knows? But the important question is, how does it work? And... Uh, Where's my empty slide? And the answer is, it does not work like a human. Uh, really, the chess program is very simple. If you say, here is my beginning position, maybe I move this pawn to here. Uh, well, you see, in a chess game, there are maybe 20 things you can do, 20 possible moves. And uh, then the other player has to move. So maybe for here, there's 10 things the other player, maybe 20. Let's say 20. And then that's for each move. And then for the other player, there's t 15 or 20 more. So if you look at all possible moves, it grows very fast course, because here there's 20 moves, and here there's 400, and here there's 8,000, and here there's uh, 660. You see how fast it grows? That's right. Uh, so in 10 moves, we have this many. impossible even for a computer to look 10 moves. So how does the computer look 10 moves ahead, which is necessary in chess? Uh, the answer is very simple. It must kill some of the branches. It's like a tree in your, in your uh, garden. You must prune it or else it gets too thick. And so uh, the computer uses a simple program to look and say, this position is no good because I lost too many pieces. And I found a good diagram to show this process. 
of tree growing and uh, killing its branches. How many people recognize this diagram? This is the great education test. I'm sorry that you failed. Uh, this is the one picture in the book by uh, Charles Darwin called The Origin of Species. So we could say that Darwin is the founder of artificial intelligence because Darwin is the first person to publish the idea that a mechanism machine could solve a problem uh, by experimenting instead of by uh, being programmed. Well, that's just a joke about biology. Now, what's my point? The point is I just showed you examples where a computer does things that people consider difficult. So you say, that computer is very smart. The chess program or the Newton program, uh, smarter than the average person. But of course, it's not true because the computer cannot do all the things that a little child can do. The computer cannot understand language. No computer can understand language now. It can recognize words. If I say, uh, I can, you can buy a computer today, and if you say microphone, computer will type microphone, will type the word. And if you say water, it will type water. And you could do mechanical translation for simple words. So if you say water, it could type agua or something. But um, that's, again, like an expert program, an expert stenographer, ex expert dictation machine. But it doesn't know what the words mean. And so uh, I'm sure you have some problems in Spanish. But in English, if we type, if I say two, then the machine doesn't know if it's the adverb two or the number two or the I don't know what that word is. Uh, <laughs> too much. Too much. Yes. What? What? What is its grammar? That's a. This is the. Yes. Okay. Good. Uh, right. My difficulty is that when I was uh, eight years old, we were told grammar, but I missed school one day. <laughs> so then I came back to school and I asked my friend Teddy Levine, uh, "What do they mean, adverb?" And he said, that's the word that ends with L-Y, <laughs> quickly. So uh, I never learned correct. Uh <laughs> yes, it modifies the verb. I did this, he did this too. So very wonderful. Now, l here's my favorite example of an expert program that does something that some children do. Uh, I'm sorry you can't see this so well, uh, but this is a very exciting program, and it's very old. It goes back to 1964, and there should be many more, but they're not. So this is still an important program. And the problem it solves, this is a bad, bad diagram, I'm sorry. Uh, it solves the problem A is to B. A is related to B, as C is to which of these? So uh, how many of you feel you know the answer? Can you see that? It's Maybe it's all right. Well, most people say this one, because you get from, you get from here to here by moving down the big circle. And here you go from here to this by moving down the big triangle. So that seems very natural. But of course, there's no correct answer. It depends 
you could justify anything. You could say, it's this, because I get from here to here by changing this big circle to a small circle. That's too much. So uh, you can make up other examples. Interesting thing is that the program, this is written by a man named Evans, and we call it the analogy program. See, and many people say there's two kinds of thinking. What are they in English is logic, and we make up our own word, analogic. Does that work in Spanish? And so now you know that in computer science, 99% of programs work by logic, and less than 1% work by analogic, but that's the important part. It is the same score as 11th grade children, so that's 17 years. This program on an intelligence test got the average score for a 17-year child, so that's very good. All right, that's the background. Uh, we have many expert computer programs that uh, do things that people cannot do, but we have only a very few programs that do the kinds of thinking that a child does. And so now I'm going to take an example of something that a child does. And uh, then you'll see why I call this lecture management. Uh, I don't believe we should have suspense. So what I'm going to say is that uh, the new theory is that the mind is full of middle level managers. And this is why we work so well. Uh, but they're very good managers, and uh, instead of fighting for power, the managers in the mind are experts at recognizing when they're not competent. And uh, instead of fighting, they like to resign. Okay, here's the famous experiment of Piaget. I should have got good glasses, but uh, <laughs> I'll take your glass. So in this experiment, uh, we take a, uh, typically a child about five years old. And the first thing is you, uh, you get the child to agree that these two glasses have the same amount of water, and you do this by, you discuss it with the child. The child says, no, there's a little bit more here, so, oops, here. So you let the child do it itself, even, and finally the child agrees. <laughs> Better not. And so next, uh, Piaget pours this water from here to here. And now we ask the child, is there more water in this jar or more water in this jar? And what does the child say? Typically, the five-year-old child says, there's more water in this jar. Sometimes the child will say, there's more water in the tall jar. Sometimes the child says, there's more water in the thin jar. But the child is very convinced, because if you make it with orange juice, and you just ask the child, which one do you prefer, and which should I give to Charlie, the five-year-old will usually take that one. Now, what about the seven-year-old? Typically, ask the same question, which, is there more water in this jar or more water in this jar? And the seven-year-old says, you're stupid. That's a stupid question. And you say, why? He said, because it's the same water, you just poured it. And uh, sometimes the seven-year-old will even say, it doesn't change the amount to pour things. 
Now, uh, of course, all children are different, and uh, if it's your child, maybe it will say this when it's six or five. Uh, just, uh, but most parents are very surprised, and they go home and try the, and they can't believe that the four-year-old does not give the right answer, and they make explanations. But. Uh, we did some, or uh, Pappard and Piaget did a few more experiments, and one experiment was very interesting, the most important one, was sometimes they would talk to the same five-year-old, and what they found is that this experiment does not work if you tell the child. You see, when we do this experiment, you really pour it right in front of the child, but uh, suppose we pour it behind a screen. Well, it's, <laughs> it's not a very good screen. And then you say to the five-year-old, is there more water in the short glass or the tall glass? What do you think the five-year-old says? Sometimes it says, that's a stupid question. Of course it's the same, uh, because you didn't spill any. So the discovery is that the five-year-old has the same knowledge. Not always, but usually. So what happens in the year from... Uh, I lost it. <laughs> these, these disappear like magic. No, there it is. I lost it in my head. Ah. So here's the management theory, just as the great example is simply that in the first place the child has three machines in its head. One machine says when we compare things, if it's taller there is more. So that's the first machine measures how high it is. So taller means more. Another machine in your head measures how wide it is. And you see it went from this wide to this wide, so it's less. And there's a third machine. The third machine does not look at the water, it looks at the story, the history. And it says, well, he did not cheat, he did not spill some, he did not add some. And now here's the theory of the five-year-old, that here are the three uh, workers. It's like a company. And when the workers agree, everything is okay. But if they disagree, we always listen to this one first. So tall is the uh, first person you ask. If tall says, I don't know, where's a good example? If you ask the child, which of those has more? What does the child say? Every child says, there's more here. The reason is that the tall, I call it agent, the piece of machinery in your head for tall, it says it has no, no answer because it says they're equal. It doesn't, it doesn't, uh, and if tall is equal, that has no effect. Uh, but wide says it's wider. So basically we get a priority. Tall is more important than thin is more important than history. Well, this works all right for children. For example, we have two children, and we say, uh, which child is bigger, this child or this child? And of course, you put the children back to back, and everyone says, this child is bigger. And uh, it even happens if you ask children, maybe you have a child like this, I can't draw. And here's the other child. And you say, which is bigger? And they say, Charles is bigger, but uh, John is fatter. But they always say bigger for the tallness. Nobody knows why, but that's, uh, that happens in, it uh, seems, all cultures. I, except sumo wrestling, maybe. <laughs> So here's the whole theory. I know that this takes a long time, but I just, it's such a simple point that it's, uh, 
We think that the five-year-old has a structure like this where there's three agents and just priority, like democracy, they vote. And Tall has the biggest vote. <coughs> but at around the age of six, and no one knows why it happens to be that age, what the happens is that in the brain, we create two more managers. And you see the knowledge is exactly the same, but now there's a manager called appearance, or whatever name you like. And now we give it the problem, and we find a conflict. Because for this manager, this one says there's more, and this one says there's less. And so what does the manager do? The manager s treats them equal now. And he says, if they agree, I will tell my boss. But if my consultants disagree, uh, then I will resign. And so uh, this whole thing cancels out because this manager doesn't send the message. And now the correct message is history. So the whole point is that the two children have the same knowledge, but, uh, but this child has organized the knowledge and keeps separate knowledge about geometry and history. And because he's organized the geometry knowledge, he can see that it's no good. You can see the conflict. If you have many different things, then all you can do is vote. And you get democracy, which is combining everyone's ignorance. Uh, uh, but still better than uh, any other way. Uh, here's another way to look at it. You see, some people say, well, can't the child do a compromise? What the child can say, well, this is thinner, but it's wider. I'm sorry. It's taller, but it's wider. But it, taller, but thinner. So they should compensate. And the answer is, that's what you could do if you were a uh, physics machine. But in fact, people cannot do it. And uh, if we do an experiment with you or me, we get wonderful results. Uh, for example, suppose I have a cube, which is uh, three inches. <laughs> so uh, how big is that? Well, you and I know that it's three times three times three equals 27. So if I have a one inch glass, look like this. It would be 27 of these. It would be off the paper. And every normal adult would say there's much more in this. They'd get it wrong. If, they, if it were orange juice, they would take a much smaller one. And that's why things come in uh, tall, thin bottles sometimes. <laughs> the marketing people know this. Uh, so what happens to the management in the mind for, for this structure? It's much more complicated than uh, I said, because, uh, oh, I had another slide, but it disappeared. Famous experiment where you have eggs and egg cups. Wave, wavos or something. So this is the first situation. Then you spread the eggs like that. Leave the egg cups there. And you get exactly the same result. Five-year-old says there's more eggs here. Even if it sees you move the eggs. And the seven-year-old says it's the same number. Uh, well, we get more structure. And uh, Papert and I studied the experiments of this. And we get. By the time the child is seven, it has a big structure of managers and sub-managers. And only the ones at the bottom level do any work. And all of these are needed to organize so that the uh, older child uh, is very competent. So one question is, how does this work in the brain? Nobody knows. But I think what happens is that. Uh, 
In the early stages of development, the brain maybe uses the long wires, and uh, then each year it starts to use more shorter wires, or maybe it's the opposite, nobody knows, but something happens so that first you build the child managers, and then the older ones are attached into it, and, uh, and the uh, brain keeps using more and more territory. Uh, this is something we cannot know because uh, we can't look to see enough about what happens inside brains. But in just 10 more years, perhaps, the brain scanner will get better, so good enough so we can see the difference in the children at different ages. And I think in 50 years, there'll be a very good thing you put on your head and can uh, see everything that's happening. And then... Uh, psychology will become a science. <laughs> now there's another side of this. Um, and you, we could ask, well, why does the child have to manage so much? Why doesn't it just discover the right answer? and do everything perfectly. Well, of course, you can see in this case, the right answer is uh, almost impossible because there's no way to measure the liquid uh, by remote control. And uh, let me develop another example where we are beginning to understand more about how the brain does things. Uh, okay, so that's one area where comp computers are not so good yet. Uh, well, they're good at making decisions of some kind, but they're not good at learning. You see, it's this development of new managers and new ways to handle knowledge that we don't do very much of. Uh, here's another place where computers are much worse than children, and this is computer vision. <laughs> Uh, there's a lot of work on making computers have vision. It's easy to get pictures to a computer. Here's your computer. And you just connect a TV with zoom lens and all that. <coughs> and then the computer can see. In fact, I built one of the first ones, and I thought that uh, after we have the input to the computer, then the students will program it to see things very soon. But uh, 20 years went by, and uh, you still cannot buy a program to connect to a computer so it would look around the room and see. What do I mean by see? Of course, it can measure the colors, but no computer yet can say, uh, there's a person, and there's a person, and that's a chair, and that's a pocketbook purse, and there's a microphone, and Here's a glass of water. A glass of water is too hard. If you ever look at it, if you look in the glass of water, there's a whole world all distorted and uh, incredibly hard. So why can't the computer see? Because we think it needs too much knowledge. Uh, well, there's a good example right here, and I, my next slide is about getting a glass of water. So here's a simple situation that you do every minute. Um, I want, suppose I want a glass. Well, there, I can see two glasses, and this one I can have without walking, and that one I have to uh, I have to walk. Uh, so how do I know the distance? Well, what's the answer? How do you know the distance of something? And here comes a very simple but strong management problem because your brain has maybe ten or twenty ways to judge the distance and uh, I won't explain them all, but 
you know what they are. For example, here are two objects. You know that this object is more distance than this one because it must be in back of that. Of course, it's possible that you're wrong because this object is actually an object that looks like this. <laughs> but, but that's almost impossible. Everybody knows that there is no object that looks like that. How do you know that? A lot of learning. Uh, a good way to tell distance is you have the two eyes. So when I look at this, my eyes point in and I can feel them. So something in my brain brings the eyes together and another thing in the brain measures how much. Then here's a good example. This is like the glasses. If these are chairs, then uh, how far is it? I know because I know how big is a chair normally. Uh, consider the glass. I know a glass is usually about the size of my hand. So uh, this thing is about the size of my hand. What does that mean? So it must be about the distance of my hand. Uh, but look at that. That's three times smaller than my hand. So it must be three arms length. One, two, three. So. Uh, this kind is using geometry of similar triangles. Oh, I could draw it like this. If I could draw. And then there's perspective, it's almost the same kind of knowledge. There's focusing. Uh, all young people have automatic focus cameras in their eyes. The older people have to get different lenses. But the point is that now we have for judging distance, maybe 10 different machines. And again, we need to manage them. And so uh, if you want to make a machine to estimate distance, uh, that's what the brain does. Well, for many years, I told all my friends working with robots that they should do this. They should, if you have a hard problem, Then write 10 different programs and good manager. And what's in the manager? The manager has a lot of knowledge. The manager knows which program is good for different conditions. But nobody does this and all my friends say, yes, maybe you're right. But I think I have a good way to do vision, and this will solve all the problems. So all my friends for 20 years are debugging. Each one is debugging the perfect program. And how many of you know people who write programs? Programmers, they're always debugging a program. Uh, they never stop and say, this program is good enough, and this one, so I should combine them and make a manager. Uh, well, recently, let's just, this slide is hard to see, I think, because I just copied it. Uh, but this is from a book by Larry Squire. And he's a uh, brain scientist, and it's a book about uh, modern theories of memory in the brain. And it's interesting that recently, just in the last three or four years, it has been discovered that uh, when you see things with the brain, uh, that different parts of the brain are very specialized. And for example, uh, here's somebody's brain. Uh, this is the front. So the eyes are here. But in fact, the eyes are connected to the back of the brain pretty much. So it's a bit of very bad architecture. And uh, it's been discovered that if you 
If you injure this part of the brain, uh, this could happen in a person with uh, arteriosclerosis or a small stroke. Then you get a very strange person. You, s you ask the person, what's on the table? And the person looks around and says, well, there's a microphone and a glass and a dish and a sign. And then you ask the patient, where's the microphone? And the patient says, I don't know. So it looks like this part of the brain has the location of the object. And this part has the names. I didn't spell. Name of object. It's very strange. It's near the language area, which is significant, not the same area. So if you uh, damage this area, then the patient will say, you say, what is there? And he says, well, there's a thing here and a thing here and a thing here. And you say, where is the dish? He says, I don't know. Uh, maybe it's this. Sometimes these patients try to guess, you see, and then it's very sad to watch. Uh, so now in the last few years, they have discovered several areas. I forget what this is. Oh, this is the area for moving the eyes. Uh, if this area is damaged, then the patient has great trouble, uh, and the patient can be there, and uh, after a while he says, oh, there's the microphone. But he has to wait for his eyes to uh, make with all of these things, including learning. Well, this is the <coughs> cortex near that organ. But uh, the picture I, the reason I present that is that the modern picture of the brain is very different from uh, what you maybe read about in the popular press. Somewhere is a beautiful picture of this. find my beautiful picture, but uh, sometimes you read stories that in the brain have you heard in the brain the memory is not in one place, but it's spread all over like sometimes they talk about hologram or holistic memory And this is a very popular idea from about 1940. But it comes from bad experiments. Uh, mostly by a good neurologist named Lashley. Lashley trained a rat to recognize the difference between a circle and a triangle. And then after he taught the rat, then he removed many parts of the brain, but the rat could still recognize the uh, difference. So he said, it means the memory is not in one part of the brain, but somehow uh, spread out over everything. Uh, but I think later, uh, two things happened. First, no one else could uh, repeat the experiment. And second, people realized that if you teach a rat this, it takes a long time takes a few days to train the rat this thing. So probably it's learned a hundred different ways to do it. And so when you take any part of the brain, uh, you still leave all the others. So now the brain's theory is much more like this. And my picture is that the brain is 400 different computers. And they're all arguing with each other. Uh, and what we have to understand is the machinery for resolving the conflicts. Uh, by the way, this slide is, which you can't read, is from a new book, well, four years old, uh, called Mind Children, 
And this is a very interesting book about the idea that brains are machines. It's by Hans Moravec. And uh, in his book, he predicts when a desktop computer will be the same power as the brain. And uh, I don't, oops, I left out the prediction. But I think it comes out to be about the year 2030. Uh, I don't have the right scale, so I can't figure that out now. I have to fix this slide. Now, I have many other things to discuss, uh, but that's, that was the basic idea, and uh, I think maybe we should stop and have some questions, and you can tell me how much more time we have. Ten minutes more? Well, uh, le yeah, let's see if there's some questions. Because I have hundreds of answers, but I don't know what question to... <laughs> It can do all kinds of uh, logic calculus. Very easy for a computer to do logic. All kinds of logic, many values, logic. Oh, yes, no problem. Yes, I think so. But logic does not help you do analogies. And so. Uh, the program of Evans does not use logic. It uses, uh, it uses guesses. It, it tries different descriptions and finds which description explains most of the features. You can decide about the complexity and the significance of the logic. Oh, I didn't understand. Complexity. I don't know in English. Complexity? About the logic theory. Oh, but completeness is not human. Uh, you see, I think all the philosophy about logic is based on a big mistake. And it assumes that human reasoning is consistent. Yes, yes. But it's not, because different parts of the brain uh, make different assumptions, and they're not consistent. So most of the time, inside the brain, there's a lot of fighting. Different parts of your brain try to do different things. But I think you are mixing lo uh, psychology with logic. No, I think everyone else is. You see, philosophers tell me that a computer cannot be consistent and complete. Or they, what? The computer cannot be consistent and complete. But who cares? Uh, who cares? Nothing can be. It's not, either can a brain, so it's not important. Because uh, I believe the logic people have exactly wrong. Because what uh, there was a logician named Kurt Gödel, Gödel's theorem. Yes. And Gödel's theorem says that any logic, if there's a logic, if the logic can express arithmetic, I'm sorry, it says that if a logic is consistent and expresses arithmetic, then uh, it cannot be, then you cannot prove everything that's true. Yes. And that's exactly the way people are. Uh, people cannot prove everything that's true. A question. Yes. When many parts of the brain are fired, is there a referee? Well, I think the, uh, I have two answers. Uh, one is that, uh, there are a series of layers of referees, and the highest referee is the simplest one. There are many linemen. Right. <laughs> but uh, most of the arguments are settled internally because a manager with a conflict loses its voice. And so uh, the small fights lead to some quiet time for the others. 
uh, but uh, let me talk about the that, that's the large scale question I just talked about small arguments then there's a big question how do the how does the person decide uh, how do I decide should I work or should I sleep and uh, so you could ask who is the president of the company? And we have uh, very funny ideas about that because there are three or four theories today about how the mind works as an organization. And uh, let me tell you the old theories. Uh, this is a very silly slide. Uh, to describe the theory of Piaget. And he says, you start out as a fairly simple machine and you learn more things and get layers and layers of knowledge. So that's, that's uh, really not fair to Piaget. Uh, and then he says, in this machine, there are certain referees. For example, if two things appear to be contradictory, then there's a system that tries to find a compromise. And he calls, he ta Piaget talks about their ideas about how this works, but I don't like them, so I can't understand them. Uh, then the great, the simplest theory is the great theory of Tinbergen, who won Nobel Prize recently for, uh, well, around 1980 for theories of animal behavior. And Tinbergen says each person is made of maybe 20 animals, one for each emotion. And so Tinbergen's picture of who's in charge for animals, and that's different from people because people have uh, additional machinery. So in Tinbergen, here's a machine for sleeping. And the bottom of the diagram, you see this is a diagram where things spread out but at the bottom they come back together. So he says, in the brain there's something for sleeping and there's something for food, hung I need food, thirst, water, and a machine for sex. And it, here we're talking about a fish or a bird, maybe there's migration. So Tinbergen's theory of the multiple animal is very, very uh, boring because he says each of these gets activated by certain signals and they each fight. And if the sleep center gets the most power, it turns off all the others. And if the food center gets the most power, it absolutely shuts off the others. And uh, what he discovered is that if you watch animals, Normally, they only do one thing at a time. If the animal is looking for food, it does not react to uh, other things very much, unless there's very strong stimulus. So Tinbergen's theory is that uh, what you have is a uh, sort of democracy where the strongest person can crush the minorities. There's two kinds of democracy, of course. There's one where you guarantee the minority's rights, and there's the kind where the majority can kill everybody else. And uh, normally the public does not understand this difference. Mm -hmm. uh, let's go back to the human being. Do you think that there is a limited number of machines and then a limited number of referees? Or is it thinkable that once in the future we think differently than now, better, let's say? Oh, I think that the future is very... Uh, I wanted to show the best slide because I think Freud had the best theory. Uh, because, see, the other theories are hierarchies that I described. But the Freud theory has concealed itself. Uh, The Freud theory is uh, 
is that there, this is 1895, really, to 1905. So I think Freud was a great uh, inventor of computer ideas. After 1905, I have no opinion about his theories because now he gets into very specific things. But he had the idea, like Tinbergen, that there are basic instincts, hunger, sex, uh, fear, uh, power, whatever you like. And this is just like Tinbergen. And then there's a reasoning machine which learns knowledge about, for each thing, how do you get food? Well, there's a big learning machine. It learns where to find food. And it learns what are the problems. And so Freud was very interested in common sense reasoning. Thinking. And then there's values. So you see, this is the sandwich of Freud. There's the instinct. There's the superego. And this is the critics. So you see, here is the wish, the goal, and here is the constraint. <laughs> so for Freud, you see, the computer is trapped, the input and output, and the knowledge. Here's all the knowledge. Here is the values that you learn from your parents. So this says, I want to get a lot of money. I want to get a lot of food. And this says, good, but you must not kill people. Uh, if you take the food, you must... It begins the way Piaget describes. Maybe, uh, it's all right to take food, but you must not let them see you or they will hurt you. So uh, in Piaget, there's some layers of development. But I think Piaget is wrong about those layers. And Freud had a, an idea of a different kind of machine. Uh, but he did not uh, explain it very much after this point. <laughs> yes. So I, I think we can combine some of the old theories for, for computers. You think that it's no referee? That it's no referee? I think there's no referee. There's a constant fight between the, the id and the superego. And certain people learn to edit this. And so... Uh, for most people, you get in a permanent equilibrium of some sort, but sometimes it breaks down and a person, has, a person discovers how to change the goals. And then uh, we get another stage of growth and maybe a few years for it to reach another equilibrium. So it's very unstable. Uh, I think there is no... I think what happens is that the human is basically unstable and societies build education systems to stabilize people. And then if a person doesn't get a good personality, the society uh, uh, does something to keep him from causing trouble. So maybe 10% of people don't fit very well, but we have ways to deal with them. <laughs> yes, a lot of the mind is outside the mind, in other words, in society. Better than a person for some things, and uh, we don't want an expensive machine that uh, goes crazy like a person for others. But most important, we want the machine to work like a person inside. Uh, now, when Turing talked about uh, this, he was saying. What would you have to do for people to believe the machine is thinking? And I think that's not a very exciting question because when the machines get good at... When we have a machine that acts like a child and learns like a child, then questions will stop and people will say, oh, well, that's very nice. I like that person. It really is a person. Some people think their car is a person. So it's not a serious question, but it's an important activity. Uh, if we just make robots for the factory, then we won't, maybe we won't make them learn enough. But if you try to make a machine like a person, uh, it's a good problem. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mostly. 
Uh, in Tinbergen's diagram, uh, he has maybe uh, this is a good example. This is for some fish reproduction. Uh, so they're internal things like a hormone, and uh, the fish has to be in shallow, warm water, and there have to be green plants. And so uh, evolution has produced very specific external inputs and very specific internal. So it's, he says there may be, for each of these, there may be many uh, factors that are born in the animal. They don't learn it. That's absolutely built in. And the reason uh, is that uh, maybe Tinbergen is not so famous, but his friend, uh, Conrad Lorenz, much more famous. And they worked together. And Lorenz discovered many things that were nobody believed at first uh, that was built into the animal without any experience. So uh, uh, what they discovered is that the animal does not just learn from experience, but it has a lot of machinery that lives in its brain for many years and then suddenly uh, is turned on. Uh, now, uh, the reason I like to compare uh, Tinbergen and Piaget and Freud is that uh, Tinbergen studied exactly what the animal does not learn. Very clever scientist. And so whenever he found the animal's behavior changed, he stopped doing that experiment. So he discovered more about how what animals do than anybody else. And Piaget did the opposite. Uh, Piaget, or rather, Piaget studies how the animal's behavior changes with time. And he discovered a lot. Uh, so, uh, but uh, it's time for another person like them to uh, combine the theories for animal behavior. And I think maybe the next step is to a great neurologist to look in the brain and locate the pieces of brain that do the things that Tinbergen observed. Uh, well, we have to wait for the car. Yeah. When you talk about different ways that the human brain has to do distance, uh, there were many ones which depended on previous knowledge. Yes. Yes. Oh, yes, there's great experiments of that. Uh, I didn't do them because they were done by somebody named Ames. And uh, you can find these in most old psychology books. He made rooms where the thing has the wrong shape from a certain point of view, and uh, it fools people. But, you know, I, I think you have another idea there, too, uh, which would be interesting with the... <coughs> If we could find the patient described by Squires, uh, I, would, I wonder if he asked, uh, does the patient know the distance when he knows the location? So there are a lot of experiments you could do if you could meet the, uh, that person. And uh, I never uh, read the original report. One trouble is uh, uh, if you try to understand the state of brain science now, you'll never do anything else. So, uh, we need a automatic information system. It's, it's got too difficult. Too much information. What about emotional feeling and reactions? Is that too far away? Or <laughs> no, I think those are the easiest thing. Uh, the difficult problem is common sense, I think. Uh, for example, Everybody knows that I can pull something with a string, but I cannot push it. But there is no theory of how that works in the brain. Uh, but for emotions, uh, there are many good theories, and they're not, not so hard to do. So the reason why we don't know more about emotions is because uh, there has been no progress in the intellectual theory of if a person is 
afraid of something, how does it engage the knowledge about what to do? Because I think the emotions are just the little boxes. Each emotion is a separate brain. Isn't that a nice picture? Uh, Uh, if you look at the Tinbergen animal, uh, there's a, a state where the animal fights aggression. Uh, here's a good example. If I have a seagull bird, he studied mostly this nice little bird. Oh, I can't draw. Should learn to draw. And the bird has a nest with some eggs. So. If the typical example is that if another bird comes over here, this bird gets very angry and uh, fights. And it gets, so it pushes the uh, other bird away. Uh, however, suppose this bird is out here and the other bird comes. Then instead of fighting, she runs back to the nest. So there's a boundary territory. And that has knowledge, because uh, she has learned to uh, have a certain territory. And so if you're inside territory, then you fight inside and attack. Then you fight. And if you're outside and uh, there's an attack, you, you retreat. So this is fear, we could say, and this is anger. Well. Inside the bird, each of these is a separate machine with its own knowledge. And uh, there's a lot of evidence that, that these things are, have, each one has its own knowledge. So I think that's what mi emotions are. When you're angry, you're partly a different person. And that's why it's hard to describe. Because the part of you that talks when you're busy is not the same as the one that angry. So. If this person tries to explain how that one feels, it's impossible. But it doesn't mean that it's difficult. It should be easy for the scientist from the outside to describe all of them. So I think it's superstition that emotions are complicated. What's really complicated is common sense reasoning, and we need more work on that. Yeah. I can blame a human person. I can blame even my, my dog. Yes. But can I blame the machine? Well, I think if... Uh, I would love to give you one more whole lecture because uh, in my book there's a chapter about this. Uh, but I, it takes a little long to explain. But uh, let me try. What there is... Here's the point. We have emotions of uh, pleasure and disappointment. So there's a positive emotion where you like something and a negative emotion. And what are these used for? Well, you see, if I try to do something, suppose I uh, I'm a child and I want to make more water in this thing, then I could go like that. And now I see I succeeded, right? I achieved my goal. I feel good. And I learn that that was a good thing to do. Uh, uh, now, I'm talking about a, a, a one-year-old one child. Uh, another thing the child could do is pour it here and then it won't work. So it'll fall on the floor, and the child says, oh, that's disappointing, I didn't fill the other cup. Now, here's a goal, fill cup. I could try, suppose I use a spoon, I could try the spoon this way, which is stupid, or try the spoon this way, and so when I get success, I learn, and this is called reward, or reinforce. I don't know the Spanish for that. Do they use that word, reinforcement? <laughs> and now here's the joke. I think this is a very strange phenomenon. If you look in psychology books, 
All psychology books on learning talk about reward and reinforcement, and they know what it's for. Pleasure is for attaching a sub-goal to a goal to find out which ones work. Okay, that's very common knowledge. Did you ever ask the psychology book, oh, how do you get the super goal? What, what generates a new goal? And you can look in all the books and there's nothing. So I think there's a mental disease of psychologists. <laughs> the obvious question is what can make attachment to a super goal? Uh, what can create a super goal and make an attachment to it? And it's not in any book except mine. <laughs> uh, and the answer is that, uh, well, where did you get these? They're just things you tried, and Skinner calls them operant. Well, uh, there are also operant super goals. You say, well, I think I'll try to fill uh, a cup in a certain way. Uh, now how can I do it? So you just temporarily try it. But what causes this attachment? And uh, uh, Dr. Long has exactly the right question. <coughs> These are two different emotions, and I don't know Spanish for them, but in English they're called pride and shame. And they're different from pleasure. Uh, if you look in Aristotle, he says, what is shame? Shame is when you have the bad feeling that you will lose the respect of somebody that you want their respect. So you see, uh, if I pour this on the floor, then I have a big risk because I respect Regini and he will say, you should be ashamed, you're making a mess of EDA. Uh, so the child, if the child does something and the mother says, that's bad, the child has a special emotion. And it's not the normal emotion of, of well, I made a mistake, I won't do that. It's the shame emotion, which is that uh, I had a bad super goal. And so uh, you try one of these, and then if, if, if your mother says, that's bad, or your father, then you cut it off, and if your father says, oh, that's very good, I'm proud of you, then you learn that way. So I think this is very natural theory. Uh, all people have these emotions, uh, but the only psychologist who recognized that pride and shame are important in, really, is Freud and his followers. But you know, modern psychologists uh, erase all history. And so you don't find Freud in psychology books today. And I think it's because uh, they get so emotional about Freud after 1910 with many unproved theories that they don't look to see the wonderful early ideas that he had before that. Uh, but people change history. You know that if you take an airplane trip in the United States uh, to Puerto Rico, uh, so here's Florida, and here's Puerto Rico. Then it says Caribbean Sea here, uh, because they don't put Cuba on the map. So. <laughs> so next time you take an airplane ride, see if you can find Cuba. <laughs> it's very funny. I don't know about Argentina. <laughs> No, imagination is just trying different things. I mean, oh yes, I think some people learn not to be, some people learn to be ashamed if they have a new idea. So I think normally the machine is imaginative because it's easy to generate new things. Creativity is very easy for machines because you just take two ideas and combine them and it's very simple. But people learn not to be creative, and that's very important. The way you get a good society is to teach people not to get new ideas. So we go to, have to spend a lot of money to prevent imagination. Okay, I want to know if you have an explanation for dreams. No. Uh, there's no good theories of dreams. Uh, there's an all right theory of uh, 
some people that dreams are for cleaning up memory a little bit. But uh, the theory is not proved, so no one knows. Maybe, maybe that the decision problem and the learning problem in the machine uh, can be solved by uh, putting in the machine some kind of consciousness of itself. So uh, the machine can depart from it and can decide. Yes, well, I think that's what the superego, the machine has a model of what it should be, what it should do, which it gets from the, somehow from the parents, and then it compares that to its, what it does do, and that stabilizes it. So it, it's very important that it has some, some knowledge about itself. I think so, and I think that's not so hard to do either, uh, and very important. For example, when you use the Lisp language, there are different kinds of programming languages, and there's a funny language called Lisp that people in, use for AI, and if the program gets a bad result, uh, it remembers everything it did or you can make it, so you can ask it, how did you get that, and it goes backwards. And uh, sometimes you wish people could, I think people are a little bit conscious, but they don't know very much about how they work. And these programs can tell you everything how they work, but they can't understand it, so we want some compromise. What's the way to teach a common sense machine? Oh, that's a wonderful question, and uh, I don't know the answer. Uh, it's very, uh, <laughs> uh, it makes me afraid when you say that, because there is only one big project in the world, uh, and it's run by a friend of mine named Douglas Lennat, who's very famous for some other experiments, Psych that's short for encyclopedia and what he wants to do is to uh, put structures in the computer to represent all the things that a typical child knows like you can pull things with string but he doesn't know how and so now he has uh, maybe a million different pieces of knowledge in the computer for social things and for political things, uh, but it doesn't have much geometry yet. And uh, he's been working at it maybe six years, and it still doesn't answer uh, a lot of questions. So uh, I'm trying to start a project which is like his, but the machine does some more learning itself. But I'm afraid no one knows how to do it. And, uh, and only one experiment happening now this is a bad thing, because this means that the machines won't be intelligent for... Uh, you see, uh, this project started in about 1985, and Lennet hoped that by 95 he'd have a big common sense knowledge base. But I think when 1995 comes it won't be so good, and then uh, maybe somebody else like me, or Ken Haas, who's my assistant, is going to start one maybe 1993 and uh, another 10 years. So if that doesn't work, see, it doesn't matter to me. All the other research in AI, artificial intelligence, does not help with this problem. And only one or two people working on this problem. So it's, uh, it's like people making new car bodies but not improving the engine. Uh, that's all the people uh, say this and recognize this mother's face. What about pattern recognition? Pattern recognizing is uh, good for fixed objects. Uh, so, for example, we can buy a machine to read printed things. But uh, very slowly, people are recognizing things like faces. Uh, I think now there's two programs that 
can do pretty good for recognizing faces, but only if they see uh, about 50 pictures first. Uh, very hard problem, and uh, there's a new kind of uh, experiments with neural networks that might help, but no one knows yet. Uh, that's the other thing. All the work on vision for 30 years, and it still can't see like a dog or a, or a cat. Because I think cats can look around and see the people. Uh, and and uh, what you said before, are motions and uh, mechanisms and not driving force? Uh, the idea of driving force doesn't work in, in uh, machines very well. Well, uh, in Tinberg and, and Freud, the driving, it's not quite a driving force, but it's an activating force. So you see you have maybe two, mach two or three of these machines, like for hunger, and this has some inputs, and it gradually increases the activity from uh, one to a hundred. And this one activity, so suppose this one's activity is 50, and this is 60, and this is 30. And that's just the score, sort of adding up the inputs. Then this is the one that's running it. And if this slowly gets up, when this gets up to 65, it just turns this off, and this one runs. So it's not like a driving force, because uh, it's just a comparison. But it looks like a force to the outside. Uh, but it's just a number. Uh, yeah. We need an amplifier. Uh, the neural networks uh, are good for recognizing patterns, uh, but they're not good for doing reasoning. So that it's very complementary. Uh, I think I have students always ask that because it's the most popular thing uh, recently. But. Uh, I have a lot about that because I uh, actually I was one of the first people to work on neural networks, but I can't find the picture. But they're very, let me just, exp they're very complementary. Uh, here's what I would say. Uh, suppose you try to explain something and it has a a few causes, and but the causes are large. So there's something, and uh, for example, what holds uh, what holds the chair? The chair is stands on four legs, so there's just four things to hold up the chair. And if you take any leg out, the chair falls. So that's very logical, you see. Uh, you can do, you can do, you can say that in words, or symbols, or language. So this is, uh, this is good for digital things. But now suppose you have a different situation where you have a very large number of small causes. Uh, here's an example. What holds this on the table? Well, it's pressure from the table. So it's a million points, and each point pushes almost nothing. So you can't talk about those million points in words. It would take too many words, and it wouldn't mean anything. But you could have a neural net with a thousand representatives. So if you have uh, many causes, and they're small, that's good for neural nets. I'm, I'm making it very simple, but so the neural net and the uh, uh, logic are kind of opposite, and in between is all of AI. And over here, there's nothing because it's too simple. It's not even interesting. 
And if you have a large number of big causes, then it's hopeless. And so neural nets is a very important extreme. But the neural nets are not good at handling uh, uh, complicated combinations of things, only simple combinations of many things. So the smart machine needs both. To recognize faces, you probably need something like neural nets, because uh, there we look at very small differences in features, and many differences. Thank you a lot. Yeah, maybe. See you later.